Okay, Janet should be coming over to be a panelist. Let me try it again because she didn't. There she is. Okay, and Amherst Media is here. There's Andrew. That's pretty spooky background for you, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, um, I had the light. There's a light behind that's in like this soffit. So it's just, if I turn it on, that's all you guys would see. Okay. Probably better yeah. with less lighting. All right. Here I am. So, so are we good to go, Pam? Yes. Amherst Media is here. You are a co host. We are recording. So we should be good to go. Okay, here we go. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of November 3rd, 2021. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.36 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media and minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town's website's calendar, listing, calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately ac access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive rec record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourself back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Jack Jemsek. Jack is absent at the moment. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. And Johanna Newman, uh, I've, I've been told, will be joining us later in the evening. And Doug Marshall, chair, is present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raised hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment period is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined to be appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, the first item on the agenda is approval of minutes. So um, Chris, do you wanna say anything about the minutes or shall we just go through them one at a time? Chris, you're on mute. Okay, so uh, you can go through them one at a time, um, but I wanted to mention the fact that Janet sent some um, corrections to the July 21st minutes and um, they were very helpful. And so when you get that far, then you can look at those. All right. In that case, um, let's see. 
we'll start with the May 5th minutes. Did anybody have any comments on the May 5th minutes? Uh, raise your hand. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Only very minor, which is just my last name was spelled incorrectly a couple of times in there. Um, M-A-C. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, I don't see any other comments. So why don't we go ahead and uh, have a motion to approve? Uh, I see Janet raise her physical hand. Thank you. I move to approve the May 5th, 2021 minutes. All right. And Andrew, I see your hand. I will second. Very good. Uh, let's go through, through the board. Uh, Maria. Approve. Uh, Tom. Approve. Uh, Andrew. Aye. And Janet. Aye, also. And I'm uh, approve as well. So it's unanimous 5-0. The next minutes are from May 19th. Uh, are there any comments on the May 19th minutes? Not seeing any. Could I have a motion to approve? I move to approve the May 19th, 2021 minutes. All right, Janet, I'll let you make that motion. And Tom, you raised your hand. I'll second. Thank you. All right. Uh, for or against the May 19th minutes approval. Maria. Approve. Tom. Approve. Andrew. Aye. And Janet? Aye. And I'm an approve as well. Again, it's unanimous of the five of us who are here. The next minutes are June 30th. Any comments on the June 30th minutes? I see no hands. Any motion to approve? Tom, Tom's raised his hand. So moved, approve the minutes. Second. Second. Thank you, Janet. No discussion. Uh, for or against approval of the June 30th minutes. Maria. Approve. Tom. Approve. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. And I'm I as well. Now we come to the July 21st minutes. Chris, do you want to, or you want to describe uh, the edits that Janet sent? Or there are, I am like, no. So there are just um, really a few on page three. I've I marked them um, with track changes, and I sent a copy to Pam today. So hopefully she's got that up. Yeah. So there was a mistake on page three where. Um, percentages the Kathy Shane wanted in mixed use buildings. Um, she said, why not go from 70% to 60% building coverage? And um, we miss, uh, we mistyped that. So it, now it's corrected to 70% to 60%. And then on page five, There was a mistake with regard to the vote. Um, the numbers were correct, four to two to zero, but the characterization of the individuals voting was not correct. So um, we've changed. Um, this was a vote on closing the public hearing on um, apartments, I believe. And um, so we've corrected the uh, vote of the individuals. And I also added the word day to the preceding paragraph where Mandy Johanneke made a comment. So 90 day clock. So those uh -huh. are the only changes. All right. Let's see. Any other, any discussion of this? Andrew, I see your hand. Yeah, I was gonna make a motion, but um, to approve, but did we skip over June 30th? Do we get that? I don't have comments on it, but I was just as I was scrolling through, I'm not sure whether. I think, 
Yes. Is that the last one we did? Okay. We All just right. did that. I misheard yeah. that. Okay. I, I, I think. Yeah, I think we got. I think we've done all we've done three so far and we're on the fourth one, which is July 21st. Perfect. I will make a motion to approve the amended minutes. Great. Thank you. Anybody want a second? Why don't I second this one? Beat you to it, Tom. All right. So uh, to approve the July 21st minutes, Maria. I was absent, so I Abstain, I guess. Okay. Tom? Approved. Andrew? Aye. And Janet? Janet, you are muted. Aye. Thank you. And I'm a, a, an aye as well. Then finally, we have the October 20th minutes. Chris, I assume there haven't been any edits to this since you sent them out. No edits, nope. Okay. Um, any discussion of these minutes? Not seeing any. Motion to approve, anybody? Motion to, uh, motion to approve the October 20, 2021 minutes. Thank you, Janet. Uh, I'll let somebody else second this time. Andrew. I will happily second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, to approve the October 20th minutes. Maria. Approve. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you all. All right. Let's see. All right, next we have public comment period. So are there any parts of the public who would like to make comment this evening on something other than the Article 7 zoning bylaw proposal and the Article 3 zoning bylaw proposal? Mr. Marshall, I see Ms. Bressrup's hand is raised. Thank you, Pam. Chris? So I'm not a member of the public. I just wanted to clarify um, who's taking minutes tonight. I think Maria offered to, and I wanted to clarify that she is doing that. Yes? OK, great. Thank you very much. That's all. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. All right, so I don't see any hands raised among the public for the public comment period, and we'll, we'll move right on to, our, to number three on the agenda, which is old business. Uh, so we'll start with our item A, the zoning bylaw, Article 7, parking and access regulations. And uh, we hope to have it conclude our discussion and vote on a recommendation of this proposal to town council this evening. So the Revised proposal for this article is to see if the town will vote to amend Article 7, parking, ex, parking and access regulations by amending Section 7.000 to clarify the parking requirements for all dwellings, including apartments, and to provide criteria for the permit granting authority to determine if an alternative ratio should be provided. All right, so uh, I'm not going to read the original proposal. It is listed in the agenda, but uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, Chris or Nate or Rob uh, or Maureen, who, who we, will be presenting this? We have Maureen presenting tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me pull up my screen here. Okay, so yes, so my name is Maureen Pollock. I'm one of the staff planners with the planning department and I'm going to walk you through the proposed uh, zoning bylaw amendment for parking space uh, requirements for residential uses. Maureen, can you get a little closer to your uh, oh. microphone? Yes, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I, I've been having uh, microphone issues this week. Uh, so let me turn, is, is that better? It's better when you're really close, yeah. And Maureen, 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 before you say that, I know I forgot to list the time that we started this particular item, and it's now 6.50, so we probably started maybe a minute ago. Thank you. Go right ahead, Maureen. 
Okay, so th thanks everyone. Um, uh, so let me just try this. Cool. Okay, so uh, this uh, this slide shows the presentation outline. Uh, walk you through the uh, problem statement um, for the zoning proposal um, proposal strategies. I'll provide an overview of uh, parking space standards, um, conventional parking standards, and uh, flexible parking standards. And then we will uh, review the existing parking space requirements and walk you through the proposed uh, um, zoning amendment language. So, okay, so, um, to, but first as a refresher, um, let's uh, review what is the existing parking uh, requirements in the zoning bylaw. So under section 7.0000, um, the minimum, there's a minimum requirement of two parking spaces for each dwelling unit is required. And under section 7.91, uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board may mo uh, request a modification of the uh, parking space requirement if one or more of the following conditions are satisfactory met. Um, and so um, there's, uh, so one, the first condition is uh, peak parking needs generated by on-site uses occurring at different times. Um, the planning department feels that uh, while this is a, a good uh, condition, it is incomplete um, in context of, uh, of residential uses. And this is really geared towards uh, multiple uses on one single property and not geared towards an apartment building or a single family home or, um, or the like. So it's really geared towards a uh, mixed use building or maybe a different uh, multiple buildings on a property that has multiple different uses on it. The second condition is a significant number of employees, tenants, patrons, or other parking users of the site are common to and shared by more than one, one use on, on the site. S similar to the first um, condition I, I mentioned, um, this is really geared towards uh, multiple uses on a property and not geared towards uh, one residential use, such as a single family home or apartment building, a converted dwelling, um, the list goes on. And then the third item is a ZBA planning board approved parking management plan is implemented with the occupancy of the buildings. Um, and the plan can include um, the following implementation measures, um, such as, I won't read it uh, read it all, but uh, you know, car sharing and um, bike facilities and, and the like. Um, Again, we feel that this is, while a great, um, a great thing to make uh, as a condition of a, a permit, it is um, incomplete in that um, while, you know, the, the town would like to encourage carpooling and, and bike share programs and providing bike racks at properties and stuff like that, um, that is um, sort of a tough sell for a reason why to request a, 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 a modification of the parking space requirement um, as, as a possible sole condition of um, to meeting that criteria under section 7.91. And um, uh, in a later slide, I'll walk you through what is a parking management plan and what does that entail and introduce a new concept, which is called uh, transportation demand management, uh, TDM uh, programs. Um, and uh, how they, uh, um, what are the differences between the two. Um, and I just wanted to, so there's been lots of acronyms probably thrown around for several months. We probably should have showed this slide um, um, before, but we just wanted to uh, recap, what are the differences of uh, the, the various decision-making authorities here in Amherst and throughout the Commonwealth? So the permit granting of, uh, board is um, uh, uh, the authority is the planning board as they review and make a decision on a site plan review application. A special permit granting authority is through the planning board or the zoning board of appeals as they review and make a decision on a special permit application. Uh, permit granting authority, um, and I, I would note that this slides I got updated um, slightly. I, I forgot to include these three bullets um, so in, in uh, the meeting packet, um, this has, uh, I added this, but I, I didn't, it's such a minor detail, I, I didn't email it over. But so the permit granting authority, they're, um, 
it could be uh, various different um, uh, boards or the building commissioner. So the planning board is a permit granting authority as they review a site plan review application. The planning board and the zoning board of appeal is the permit granting authority as they review a special permit application. And the building commissioner is the permit granting authority as uh, they uh, review a building permit application. And so um, the next slide goes through uh, the problem statements that uh, the planning department has identified uh, with the parking requirements under uh, the existing zoning bylaw. So the, uh, the existing parking space requir requirements re rely on um, conventional um, parking standards, um, which is um, looking at uh, which is uh, minimum parking standards based on publications like the Institute of Transportation Engineers uh, Parking Generation Handbook. Um, th that handbook recommends uh, ratios that are generic and broad that are applied throughout the whole nation and are not specific uh, to a, a community or a region. Um, often these standards do not account for factors relative to the site, neighborhood, and community scale. Um, additionally, these minimum ratios are um, often close to, if not the maximum ratio, which ac accounts for the worst case scenario. Um, and so the reason to have a, a minimum uh, parking uh, requirement um, that you know historically is to is to have parking spaces on the property and to prevent spillover onto adjacent properties. So that's the historic, you know, purpose of it. Um, you know, over the decades, uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineers has uh, increased that or has a um, a higher ratio to um, prevent spillover. And in, in doing that, that is why you have seen throughout communities you know, uh, across the nation with oversized parking lots, um, you know, a, a shopping center, a mall, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, that is sort of this sort of conflict uh, of, of um, conventional parking stand standards is that they are these generic numbers that don't account for local factors. I will, in a later slide, introduce to you um, uh, another um, parking standard, which is known as uh, flexible parking standards. And that's one way to improve upon uh, conventional parking standards and allows the permit granting authority and the applicant um, the ability to consider more flexible and efficient parking standards based on the principles of flexible parking um, standards. Um, the second bullet is uh, section 7.00 only imposes minimum parking space requirements for land uses under the zoning bylaw. Um, and um, there is no maximum um, uh, uh, um, number provided. Um, and that is um, uh, can be prob problematic in that, again, it, it's um, it's saying that there is no maximum amount that you could have on a property. Uh, you know, I think that most, you know, the planning board and the ZBA probably would say, you know, nine out of 10 applications is all the applicant is just uh, requesting the minimum and they don't really go, you know, ask for more. But um, it is a problem um, when it, uh, or it could pose a problem um, if that um, big parking lots is not desirable in a Permit granting authority wants to have use their discretion uh, under um, you know you know uh, uh, their discretion in you know modifying or, or seeking an alternative ratio, um, and then focusing on parking requirements. And so those first two bill bullets are really applicable to all parking space requirements for all land uses under the zoning bylaw. Um, the next one through four uh, bullets here is focusing on parking requirements for residential uses. Um, and so the criteria uh, for considering those modification requests, um, as I outlined in the previous slide, are incomplete and confusing uh, for the planning board, the zoning board of appeals, and applicants. Um, you know, specifically those criteria that I listed off in the previous slide are really applicable for properties that have multiple uses on them, and they're not applicable for a single residential use, such as an apartment building, a single family home, or a duplex. Number two is uh, parking space modification requests for land uses 
that are allowed by right can only be done by special permit. So for example, a single family home under our zoning bylaw is a by right use, meaning they don't need to get a spe special permit or a site plan review. They just need to get a building permit through the inspection services. Now, if they wanted to modify, modif request a modification of their parking spaces, that, um, that applicant or homeowner would actually technically need to uh, request a special permit through the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and so that is um, problematic in creating you know, additional hoops for buy right uses. Number three, parking space requirements by land use are listed at the beginning of Article 7. The section for modification requests is listed separately at the end of Article 7, which has been missed by potential applicants. I have, um, I hear this sometimes on the phone when I talk to applicants and homeowners that they're unaware of that they have to, you know, go to, you know, 10 pages over to uh, find that, um, that section for a request. Number four, mo uh, waiver modification requests are often seen as deterrents from an, uh, from, uh, for an applicant and are, uh, are unpredictable, like a variance request for potential applicants. Okay, next slide gets into the, the proposal strategies. Um, number one is to incorporate flexible uh, parking standards. Um, uh, well, firstly, I would say is to establish a minimum and maximum parking ratio as a safeguard to prevent excessively large parking lots from being built, um, managing stormwater, increasing densities where appropriate, and meeting transportation demand management objectives for the town. Um, so establishing the minimum and maximum and giving the discretion to the permit granting authority to um, consider alternative ratios. Um, and, um, and those uh, considerations would be based on specific uh, uh, specific factors uh, using principles of flexible parking standards. And again, we'll get into that in a few slides. Uh, number two, require a parking management plan for all residential uses, which outlines how the applicant will manage and enforce the parking. Um, I'll get into that later of um, what that all means. And number three, provide, uh, let's see here, provide specific criteria required for evaluate, uh, evaluating a proposed alternative ratio. So both the permit granting authority and the applicant know what needs to be submitted and what needs to be reviewed for the permit granting authority's determination um, of what is adequate, what is an adequate amount of parking um, for that project at that property based on specific factors. Um, number four, on a project by project basis, require applicant to submit contingency based measures that can be deployed if needed in the future. We'll get into what that means later on. Five, make the permit process less arduous for applicants requesting alternative parking ratio for a by right use, such as uh, ADU accessory dwelling unit or a single family home. Number six, Specify parking space requirements, including alternative ratio requests for residential uses under the same se section, instead of later on in the bylaw, which currently requires additional waiver modification request. Okay, so now I'm going to give a very uh, broad overview of, um, of uh, two uh, uh, types of parking standards. Uh, the first one, we'll talk about conventional parking standards. And the next one will, is uh, flexible um, parking standards. So conventional parking standards um, are parking are requirements that are generally based on the Institute of Transportation, ITE for short, Parking Gen Generation Handbook. The handbook provides a ratio of parking, uh, of number of parking spaces required per uh, square foot per dwelling unit or other measure of intensity by land use type. The handbook does not usually take into, into account geographic, demographic, and economic factors that can impact demand, such as whether a site is urban or suburban. So it doesn't take into account the local uh, conditions um, that's unique to that site, neighborhood, or community. Um, the handbook was always intended to be used in conjunction with information about local conditions 
so generic standards may not account for the local needs. So I'm going to now give you an overview of, uh, based on my research of um, parking publications um, and uh, from state documents um, from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, smart growth, um, smart growth model bylaw, um, regional planning agencies, and um, planning consultants um, um, have all the publications that I've been reading over the over the you know the last few months is um, has this theme that gets to um, flexible parking standards, and so uh, I'll walk you through what what are sort of principles of these standards. Um, so to help improve the generic parking standards. Um, as conventional parking has always sort of, you know, demonstrated through the decades, is um, to consider alternative parking ratios based on specific criteria, um, require a parking management plan, anticipate future parking demands, and explore other strategies. Um, so consider alternative uh, parking space ratios on a project by project basis, which takes into account specific geographic, demographic, and or economic factors that affect parking demand. I won't read this all out, I'll, um, but you know, factors could include um, uh, analysis of traffic impact reports, um, analysis of parking studies, um, looking at you know, what is the availability of parking within 800 feet of that project site, um, you know, be it on street or off street parking, public or private park parking. Um, in a, uh, and uh, demographic examples factors could be um, senior housing uh, um, and um, economic factors could be, and demographic factors could be um, affordable housing uh, projects. So, you know, uh, what was the first, the, the affordable housing, you know, project, um, project uh, factors, sorry, uh, could be that the, the, the tenants living at that affordable housing um, building, you know, have really low, you know, AMI um, and, you know, their you know, transitional housing from homelessness to, uh, you know, a, a studio apartment. And you know there there could be an argument that they probably couldn't afford a car, and so therefore why why is there this need for that amount of parking spaces, you know, for senior housing? You know there could be, you know, sort of this argument of you know perhaps you know people in their you know older years uh, don't drive or have cars. Um, this proposal is not going to take an. A, uh, does not take into account demographic and economic factors um, because we feel that um, lo locational or geographical um, factors um, sort of uh, are a better indicator of what 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 is going on in that neighborhood and can support sort of uh, demographic or economic factors as well. Number two, provide a parking management plan to address how parking will be managed and enforced. So what could that include? Uh, it can include a parking map, uh, which shows um, the location, the number of the parking spaces on the property or on adjacent properties, if applicable. So, if, um, so it would show, you know, you know, parking one, two, three, four, five is shown in the driveway. It would be laid out and numbered. Um, if there's ADA parking spaces, that would be labeled. Um, things of that nature. And uh, the written narrative would explain how the parking spaces will be designated. Is it first come first serve? Are there parking decals or signs? And it'll explain how the parking will be managed and enforced by the applicant, homeowner, or the, or the um, property management company for the tenants and visitors. And, you know, if someone, is, if there's only four parking spaces in the in, on the property, but there always seems to be 10 cars parked there. Well, the, the parking management plan will explain, you know, what are the roles and responsibilities of that owner 
to enforce that? Are they going to notify the tenants by email? Are they going to tow within 24 hours? Um, it, these are great mechanisms for inspection services to enforce um, these uh, matters um, if they become pro pro problematic. Um, number three, consider contingency based measures that can be deployed if needed in the future. You know, parking demands um, will are not static. Parking demands will change over time. And planners, you know, um, a good tool for planners to look at and encourage is contingency based measures that can account for the changing parking demand, perhaps the land use changes, perhaps the number of tenants uses, um, the, the number of tenants uh, change, the demographics change, or the economic factors change. There could be a variety of reasons why a parking demand changes over time. Either more parking is needed or perhaps less parking is needed. Um, so um, contingency-based measures could include uh, transportation demand management program, and this, this actually sort of is, is what is um, articulated in the existing 7.91, the condition number three. And I think that is what that is trying to get to this, the transportation demand management, which gets into how do you get the owner, the developer to impose and encourage uh, the reduction of parking demand for their tenants and visitors of the development for the future um, by supporting carpooling, offering subsidies for transit, providing you know bike facilities, um, and uh, providing shelter service for off-site parking facilities. I'm sure that there's other options, but this is, gives you a snapshot of what what that's trying to get at. And then um, we spoke about this in previous meetings: is uh, shadow parking. Um, you know, so if um, if a developer um, is, you know, requesting a reduction of parking, um, but the permit granting authorities is saying, oh, well, let's have this contingency measure. We'll grant you the, the, the reduction, um, but let's have you let's have you show on your approved site plan where additional parking could be provided in the future if that parking demand changes and it doesn't need to be built now, but in the future, if we, the permit granting authority, believe that the parking demand changes, we're gonna require you to convert that, you know, that grassy strip to a fully functional um, amount of parking spaces. Um, and number four, explore other tools and techniques based on um, flexible parking standards. Uh, fee in lieu of parking spaces is an alternative to requiring on-site parking facilities by allowing reductions to minimum parking required requirements in exchange for a develop uh, for development payment into a municipal parking or traffic mitigation fund. The accrued money from the municipal parking fund helps finance town-owned, centrally located, off-site parking facilities. Um, other strategies is uh, reviewing um, the municipal parking districts. Um, there, there are many communities that have municipal parking districts in their downtown. Um, and, you know, obviously here in Amherst, but there are, there are many, and I, I've discovered there are many. And um, exploring what works, what doesn't work, um, and exploring um, the existing uh, parking permit system, what's working, what's not, turning to the, you know, the recent, you know, parking plans um, that were created a couple years ago, looking at those recommendations and seeing, hey, you know, what needs to be implemented or, or stopped or changed, and also um, reviewing changes to parking space requirements for non-residential uses. Um, so this proposal um, is um, focusing on residential uses, but that would be a, a, a good strategy to explore um, um, the non-residential uses. And just to um, 
we already went through the slide earlier, but I just wanted to show it again. Um, uh, this slide shows the, the existing parking language, which again, um, there's a minimum requirement of two parking spaces for each dwelling unit for all residential uses. And um, section 7.91 allows um, the planning board and the zoning board of appeals to um, consider a parking reduction for one or more of the conditions listed here. And again, the planning department feels that while th these are the first two are very important and are, um, um, you know, a, a good criteria to consider a parking reduction. Um, but it, it is limiting. Um, and the third bullet is 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 a good start. Um, but again, it, it's incomplete. And so now I'll go turn over to the uh, to the draft language. Um, I have it in the marked up version, and I do have it in the cleaned up version. I, I don't know if there's a preference, but um, but so um, nothing's changed since the last time we have met. Um, so to the draft language. So um, you know, currently, uh, you know, there is a municipal parking district. We just wanted to remind folks um, to say that you know that. Uh, the educational districts and the municipal parking districts um, do not have parking requirements. Um, and that, um, and we just wanted to point that out. Um, and then later in this paragraph, um, we wanted to um, propose that, that, that the parking spaces uh, shall provide uh, a minimum and a maximum um, it would be one one number, the same ratio of two parking spaces per dwelling unit, um, and to only give the discretion to the permit granting authority to determine if if an applicant wants to go uh, less than two spaces or more than two spaces per dwelling unit. It would be at the sole discretion of the permit granting authority um, as they evaluate um, the, that uh, specific um, criteria and which is listed here. Um, so um, uh, bullet one is a bedroom count. So, you know, if an apartment building, for instance, has, you know, 10 two bedroom units um, and they have five studio apartments, does the studio apartments need two spaces uh, per studio? Or would there be a compelling argument for one car for per studio, or uh, or less? Uh, so that would be um, speaking to sort of that economic and demographic um, sort of factors of of how many people would be living in a studio apartment. Is it just one person, or is it four people? Um, and so that would be a conversation as part of. Of, um, of that review. Uh, traffic impact is identified in traffic reports. Parking utilization is documented through surveys of public or private on and or off street parking within, within 800 feet of the pro proposed use. Peak parking needs generated by on-site uses, Proxmix, proximity to downtown, uh, public transit, public parking, including on and off street parking, Availability to alternative modes of um, transportation, uh, tenant lease restrictions relative parking, and shared and lease parking as um, as regulated um, in the zoning bylaw. Um, in addition, the amount of parking spaces provided for each dwelling unit shall satisfy the provisions under section 10.38 and 11.24. And one thing I I think I didn't capture is that. Hold on a second. Um, the, let's see here, sorry. The permit granting authority shall approve a parking management plan. And that would be for all um, parking, um, for all residential uses, regardless if they're asking for an alternative ratio um, of the planning department and inspection services believe that this is very important uh, um, to help um, the developer to manage their parking and enforce it, and if needed, um, for in 
the enforcement team to um, refer, refer to. And then under section 7.9, the only changes is um, to say that, um, you know, the parking, uh, that, that uh, parking modification requests would remain um, for non-residential uses under 7.91 at the moment, and that a request for an alternative parking ratio would be captured under um, the beginning of 7.00. Um, and you know, when the planning department explores parking for non-residential uses, uh, we would want to, um, I think, eventually sort of remove this section here entirely and put it um, with the parking space requirements um, at the beginning, um, which is um, would be um, under section 7.0. Um, but again, we're solely um, just looking at residential uses. So I think that's all I have and I'm happy Thank to you. answer any questions. Thanks, Maureen. So if I understand you right, the bylaw that that you're proposing has not changed from the last time we uh, discussed it and your present, the bulk of your presentation, the intent is to give us a little more background on why this is a good thing to do? Correct, yeah, yep, yep, yes. Okay. All right, all right, are there any, uh, is there any board discussion of this uh, uh, proposal, Andrew? Thanks, Doug. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Maureen. I thought actually the PowerPoint, for whatever reason, um, connected with me a little bit better this time. So um, I thought it was well done. And I'm wondering, um, does any of the language in that PowerPoint belong in here? Like the concepts around shadow parking, for example. Um, so just a, a couple of thoughts, since like you've done a nice job illustrating the, the background for it, do we just use that common vocabulary? Um, and then on a couple of these areas as well, from the PowerPoint, you'd mentioned, you know, that that the plan could include such items. Some of those, I think, like they absolutely should include, right? And um, and at least a, a, there's, I think, like two or three of them that really hit on one of my concerns um, from I think the last time you presented, which is really, do we have like a, uh, do we feel like we have a really good understanding of how many parking spaces there are in town? Period, right? And I think the notion of having a map um, is uh, would be wonderful, right? Just you know, if somebody were to suggest that, hey, I can put put three spots on three parking spaces in this piece of property, like show us that you can um, by putting it in, in some type of plan form. Um, so to me, like again, you've said some of it could be included. I think I think some of it absolutely should, uh, and and um, hopefully that's something that the, the granting authorities will take into account. I know we've got, you know, reference to that in terms of management plans and so forth, but uh, overall, um, I think I think this is looking really good. Um, so thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Janet, you are muted. Yes, thank you for the presentation, Maureen. I, I, there's a lot more like meat on the bones in terms of, um, you know, current thinking about parking. I wish we had had a lot of this information before the um, amendment came to us and um, we could have shaped it to shape it better. Um, I have some very specific questions about the PowerPoint. And the first one was, I didn't understand why you felt like the provisions that already exist in the bylaw about peak parking were in incomplete because they seem pretty clear to me and pretty comprehensive. So how are they incomplete? Maureen? Yeah, the, so- To the slide, yeah. maybe. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think the um, one second. Um, I think that those two conditions are great uh, in their own right, and um, and and which are translated into the proposal as well. So they do carry over to the proposal. We're not trying to. Um, I think, but they're already in the bylaw. So is there's is there some deficiency in the bylaw because they talk about peak parking at different times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Years parking. So I, I don't know why those are incomplete. So they're, they're already... incomplete in that they're only applicable if there's multiple uses on the property. So if you have a mixed use building, as you know, has residential and 
presumably retail and commercial, those are different uses. And so peak parking needs are generated, uh, you'd be exploring and investigating, well, what are the peak parking uh, needs on the site um, for the restaurant versus uh, the residential use? Uh, you would have, um, and, and, um, and if they're at different times, meaning they don't conflict at those peak um, parking um, hours or um, that then the board would say, oh, okay, you're making a stronger arg argument for your parking reduction. Um, but so, if, if there's just, a use that me, only has an apartment building, um, there wouldn't be multiple uses and therefore there wouldn't be a different parking, uh, different parking needs generated at different times. They're all at the same time. Do you see that subtle, do you see the difference of, no. of, so like for instance, so let's just play out a scenario, mixed use building that has apartments and a breakfast restaurant. No, no, no Maureen, I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm making my questions not clear. We've already done that where we have mixed use buildings and we're saying, okay, during the day, the retail is open, cars will be coming in and out. Um, people will, you know, will be parking mostly at night because, you know, at least half the people will drive out to their, their, you know, whatever they're doing. So that's in the bylaw. So how would a peak parking analysis of an apartment building differ? Do you think some people will be like working all night and not parking at night? Like, I mean, I see the bylaw that already has this language. I'm not sure why. I'm just asking you, why is it incomplete? Because we've done that. We, we do look at. Yeah. So let's look at a different um, bullet here. Number uh, C, parking studies provided data to support requests to reduce or increase parking. So let's say there's an, apart there's an apartment building proposal. They would like uh, less parking. And they're saying there is available parking up and down the streets uh, within 800 feet of this property. No one is parking on the street. Um, and there is a always vacant parking lot that's right across the street and it's and uh, they would be providing a parking study to prove or disprove whether um, there could be parking provided on adjacent properties um, and that would help their argument or that would that would be their pitch to you the planning board of um, saying, yeah, we, we would like this parking reduction because there's a municipal parking lot across the street is always va uh, uh, vacant. We have uh, demonstrated uh, having uh, parking studies. We've gone out at, you know, 8, 12 and, and at 6 o'clock and at midnight for the last four nights. And we, you know, and they uh, made a study of what is the parking um, on that um, municipal parking lot across the street. And they would be looking at all the parking within 800 feet of the property um, to explore, you know, what what is what is the existing conditions, um, so, and that. So, well, Maureen, Maureen, I I I am not sure you're really answering Janet's question about what's incomplete. Um, because that's shared. I mean, that's no, if you're looking at a lot across the street, that's shared parking, and that would come in front of the ZBA or the planning board, and we've done that. I mean, I actually encourage that. So I I see that already in the bylaw. I mean, I think you're adding on-street on parking, which is sort of a separate issue, but we already have peak parking. We already have shared parking. So I didn't understand, and we already have management plans. So I'm, I'm not quite sure why the bylaw is incomplete in those respects. Well, to some degree, um, you know, whether we agree with the PowerPoint presentation, I mean, this we're gonna be really looking at the bylaw. And um, I, I, I I, I understand that there may be questions about Maureen's presentation and parts of the PowerPoint, but I think we should focus on the bylaw itself because that's really where we're headed this evening. Well, that's actually what I'm saying is if you look at the bylaw, all this is already there. Um, so yeah, sure. and, and I think I think the the big thing was that they moved some of those criteria that were at the end of section seven forward so that they were, uh, noticed earlier by by everybody who might want to be reading about parking, and um, and not quite such a uh, an, perceived as such an obstacle. So, Chris, do you want to say something? Just wanted to reiterate Maureen's point, which is that 
Section 7.91 deals with multiple uses on a site. We want a bylaw that can deal with multiple uses as well as singular uses. And we think that this um, proposed bylaw deals better with that situation. I think that 7.91 is very limiting in the fact that it only really deals with um, multiple uses on a, pro on a pro property. And I think we list a few extra things in here um, that aren't listed in 7.91. So I think that it's more complete in that way. OK. Thank you, Chris. So, so I have some other things to, to, to go into. Um, so the other question I have is, um, I have never heard um, the building commissioner referred to as the permit granting authority. And I remember in town meeting, um, the bylaw, the zoning bylaw was being revised to, to stop saying ZBA planning department, but to say permit granting authority as a comprehensive to cover both. Cause it, you know, it's kind of awkward sometimes, but I, I'm, I'm a little surprised to see that the building commissioner would be included in as in that. And I looked in the definition sections and it's not there. So, I don't know if that's common use, but I don't think it's Amherst use. And I think we should think carefully about that. I also think if the building commissioner needs some help, um, um, some flexibility in terms of modifying parking requirements, we can just do that quickly with a sentence in this bylaw that lets him do that or her do that for um, single family homes and ADUs. And so I don't think we um, have to kind of change the definition or the use of the terms permit granting authority. So I, I was startled by that. And I'd like us not to jump into that because I don't, I've never heard it used to cover the building commissioner. The other thing is, is that a parking modification can be done by the ZBA or the planning board without a special permit. It's just in the, it can be, the modification can be made, um, the waiver can be made in, inside the proceeding. So if, if the ZBA is looking at a special permit, somebody wants a waiver, they ask for it, the ZBA considers it and maybe grants it. If the planning board is doing site plan review, somebody wants a parking waiver, you don't need to get a special permit, you know, to do the two weeks notification because it's it's very clear in section 7.9 that that doesn't have to happen. So there aren't these impediments to getting that waiver. And as we know from all the permits that we've issued, people ask for waivers all the time. If, if, if people reading this bylaw don't understand that you can get a waiver because it's five page later, it's very easy just to put in in section in the beginning is, you know, waivers can be, you know, obtained under section 7.9, just to give an early heads up. Um, and I think that would help the structure, the kind of thin down the confusing structure of this um, amendment, which is talking really essentially about waiving what is very a clear requirement and putting it in the beginning and then there's waivers at the end and you're saying this section doesn't apply here and that I think it's just kind of messy. But I do think there's some simple ways to alert people that you can get a waiver. Um, there is no need for a special permit for a waiver. And if the building commissioner needs special authority to apply the waiver standard, that can be done explicitly. But I don't think we should do it under permit granting authority. So those are a bunch of big things. Um, so, Janet, is that most of your comments? Not yet, but I, I'm happy to cede it to other people for talk to. Yeah, I think we should share the time a little bit. Um, Chris? So I wanted to explain the permit granting authority. I agree that it should be in the definition section of the zoning bylaw, but it isn't yet. Um, but the building commissioner has been given more um, authority to grant permits than he was in the past. Um, and some of it has to do with um, single and two family homes. Some of it has to do with ADUs that we just um, approved. And some of it has to do with um, administrative approval of, of minor changes. So um, little by little, what we're trying to do is make it easier for people to build residential um, units and not have them have to come to a board or um, a planning board or a zoning board of appeals and be able to carve out certain uses that the building commissioner can um, approve because we have certain criteria that are clear and we uh, allow him to grant the permit based on these criteria. So in those instances, um, he is needing to um, think about whether the 
two spaces per dwelling unit is appropriate or not. And he doesn't have the ability to hold a public hearing as a, a, a board would. Um, so this would give him guidance as to how to determine whether um, two spaces per dwelling unit was really needed. And um, so I agree with Janet that we need to list permit granting authority in the definition section, but I think we're you know, moving towards um, granting the building commissioner more authority to um, approve certain things. And therefore he needs the authority to um, be able to consider whether the parking requirements are reasonable or not. Thank so, you, Chris. Um, Janet, gonna... Janet, please. Please, Janet. Um, are, are we going to come back to this issue? Just yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come back giving... to you after we have other people talk. Maria? Uh, so, yeah, thanks for this, Maureen. I might have missed the last meeting this was brought up. So, this is a, a lot of information for me. And um, I think this is definitely a step in the right direction. I've never liked uh, spending hours and hours debating uh, the two parking unit, uh, two parking spaces per unit for every project. And this will really not only make it go more effectively, not just efficient, but effectively, but it also will give people who are trying to do projects to you know help them understand what the criteria are to make adjustments to ratios. Because before they were just coming blindly and they had to come back, you know, repeated times. Um, I remember a couple of specific projects where we, this, the planning board had to do that, where they just didn't know what to bring and we would ask them each time and they'd come back month after month. And so this is great. It just lays it all out there. Like if you wanna change the parking counts, this is how to do it. And I think that's very necessary because if we are serious about being a sustainable green community, I think that we need to take another look at this two unit per two space per unit um, black and white thing we have in the zoning bylaw, which is antiquated. And um, and yeah, I, I agree. I, to me, that was the one piece that was incomplete in my mind in that um, uh, it, it, it needed to be, like you said, Maureen, in your presentation, it needs to be weighed parcel by parcel, neighborhood by neighborhood, and then look at the streets, look at the context. It, there are so many different factors and to just lay this one requirement across the board, just like you said, you know, it just, it's a, a generic rule that uh, is not in the right direction if we want to provide alternative modes of transportation as potential ways for our community to, you know, think about how we live and how we use our resources. So I think this is great. Um, now I also appreciate the removing of uh, waivers, because I, I, being in the building industry, I know how hard it is when a person sees the word waiver and they realize, okay, that adds two months to our process and, you know, time is money. And so, um, yeah, I think all these are in the sort of incremental steps in the right direction, whether or not the language is there. I, I'm not a bylaw uh, language expert, but I feel like the next version where you just had it all black and not, not all the stripes and yellow stuff everywhere. Um, it made sense to me. I, I don't know. I, I Maybe I'm used to reading bylaws, but um, it seems pretty clear what it's asking for and and what it asks people to bring if they want to change things. So um, I think this is a great step in the right direction. And I, I hope that um, we can, this is something that was a long time coming. We, I, I really wanted this number to change. So thank you for all this. And thank you for all that research you, you've been collecting from like, you know, the, the sort of standards and, and what other studies have proposed. And so, um, yeah, for now, I think let's keep it simple, not pile up too much more like, like little things. Let the people coming to the town bring um, their ideas and their alternative strategies. But, you know, you've sort of set a sort of baseline and sort of some ideas. But um, for now, let's, I, I'm, I, I think this is a great start. And I think that we should definitely push it forward however we need to. All right, thanks, Maria. Uh, Janet? So getting back to the building commissioner, I think we just need to be explicit in here and give him the authority to, to apply the waiver language. If someone asks for a waiver for an ADU or a home, though it's hard to picture a home with less than two parking spaces or an ADU, because you always think like, 
likely one person will have a car and then they'll have a guest, you know, or maybe two cars when you have an AD of thousand square feet. So I think we should just be really upfront. And, you know, when we're talking PGA, we mean ZBA and planning board. When we're talking building commissioner, we'll be explicit. Um, but if we change the bylaw to say PGA includes the building commissioner, then you have to look at a hundred pages and see what the impact of that is. Cause it could just reverberate in, strange and terrible ways. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, a, 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 it sounds like a very technical issue, but I think it have, could have very big consequences. Um, I do think, I, you know, I, I, I think that we need to take a pause and get some information. And so I don't see that there's, I mean, is there a problem with the two spaces requirement for parking? Like, do we have, you know, we have 20 apartment complexes. We have multitude of smaller apartment buildings. We have many, many homes. Is there too much parking at different complexes or at you know all the six unit apartments along Main Street? You know, is is there too much you know paved space but no one's using it? I actually I think that most of the parking spaces that I see along Main Street are in full use. Most of the apartment complexes are. Um, some of them don't, but I just think in a way, you know, we have this two parking space requirement. We have a one parking space requirement for, you know, rooming houses, you know, based on bedroom count. Like you have to pick a number. And then I think if we want to waive that, I think all this kind of um, these different factors need to be go into the waiver section so it can be, you know, applied consistently to the different types of um parking situations people are, instead of repeating it or management plans, a lot of duplicative language that's very unclear. Um, I also think that listing the factors isn't enough, that we need information. So, you know, a studio apartment at Aspen Heights allows up to three different um, occupants. Um, you know, it, what, if the, what if the apartment building is filled with four bedroom units? Um, what if it's right downtown? What if it's nowhere near shopping? What if it's a multitude of bedroom counts and stuff? And so as a planning board, I don't really, I mean, how do we assess the factors? Like what information, we're just speculating. We're like, well, this has a lot of two bedroom units. We think it's two cars or there's no shopping nearby, which is actually not a factor, right? Um, or it's near downtown, but you can't shop downtown. There's very few doctors. And you know, I think we're just going to sit around and engage in speculation. And so I think we need information to say, is bedroom count going to tell you something? Is square footage going to tell you something? Is proximity to downtown going to tell you something? Well, let me say, we know the municipal parking district has about an average of one car per residential unit. And so, you know, and, you know, but we need that information as the boards to understand how to evaluate the criteria. Otherwise, we're just sitting around guessing and we'll have really inconsistent results. Um, and we have, I think, four or five projects that have less than two spaces per um, residential unit. Three of them haven't been built, two have, and have just started to go. Aspen Heights has less than one, two spaces per um, residential unit. It also has a 12 hour shuttle to UMass and to shopping center. So if you live there, you can just jump on the shuttle. So we could find out how is that working for people? Are people living there, but still have cars somewhere else? You know, and so I think there's a lack of, you know, evidence for us to make decisions. And I, I think that's just a huge omission. I'm not promoting two, <laughs> two parking spaces per car, but I do think that it seems to be working well and the waiver has let four or five different developers get adjustments and we don't, we guess that and we don't know if that's working well. So let's figure that out before we, you know, pick factors and we should, you know, we should pick age and economic um, people, lower income people are less able to afford cars. They may need cars, they're less likely to own it. We know that. Um, so a low income housing project would probably need less car, or have less cars, not need less cars. All right, what's your next 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 point, please? I mean, you, you want more data. I, I, I get that. Yeah, so so basically, um, so the factors that bother me are two. One of them is if you allow the people who own properties to not let people have cars by lease condition, that's not addressing the need for the residents' need for parking, which I've talked about before. 
but it also is going to create what we, the spillover effect of putting cars onto the streets, other parking lots and things. And so if it's shared parking, that's fantastic. Um, if it's on street parking, I think that we have to think very deeply about this because the TSO has a, a series of standards that developed about when is on street parking okay? When is it safe for pedestrians and vehicles? If you had on street parking in front of my house on both sides of the street, cars would barely be able to go down the street. Um, certainly the fire truck couldn't. And so if we start counting spaces on Southeast Street or Main Street, and you know everybody can park there, there's no restriction on it, it's gonna have a huge impact. And so I think that's something the TSO is interested in looking at. So I think this is a big factor that if we start counting on street parking without working our way through the town council process and the town council is part of the public way. Um, I think there's one more big issue. Um, so I'll, I'll hold it there. Okay, thank you. Maria? Um, those are all really good points, Janet, but I think that's exactly what this bylaw is asking the potential developer or homeowner or property owner to do, which is provide exactly what you're saying. Provide the uh, parking management plan, whether it's on street, off street, provide so local data. I mean, I think the factors that Maureen listed are literally the things you're asking for. So rather than getting that data, we're asking people to bring that data if they want to provide a certain number of parking spots. So I think what you're bringing up is exactly right. We wanted to have that data, but to have that in the bylaw doesn't make sense. It makes more sense for people per parcel to say, all right, we are right next to the village center. We have X, Y, Z number of bus stops, or we're gonna provide shuttle service as part of our parking management plan. So I think what all these points you're bringing up are exactly the things that will be shown based on this parking uh, zoning amendment. So um, so yeah, I guess I'm not too clear, you know, it's not even chicken egg to me. And the way this is literally saying, here are the ways you can show us. And then all the questions you're asking are exactly what a potential um, developer would bring to the table to, to say, you know, we only need one parking space per unit, or we actually need three parking spaces per unit. You know, I don't know, but that's for them to tell us. And I think that this is what this bylaw is saying. Am I yeah, incorrect yeah. in that? <laughs> yeah, that, it seems like uh, it'll, the onus will be on the developer to convince us why two parking spaces per unit is not needed, up or down. Tom? Um, Sure, thanks, Doug. I just had a point of clarification in regard to the building commissioner question. Um, when I look through the, the memorandum, I don't see any statement in there about adding the building commissioner line to this document. So is that is that in here? Am I missing that? I was suggesting it. Right, but it but we're not talking about that today, right? That's because right. it's mean, not in this document. Right. Uh, what's and you're saying that, thing? and it's not it's not in there anywhere. It's not included in the permit granting authority anywhere else. So we're not really talking about it today. Maureen? Um, do, do we so need to be talking about the definitions of these terms in this conversation today? Um. That, that's a good question. I don't know if uh, Chris Breastrep or Rob Mora would want to weigh in. Um, perhaps um, if it's deemed necessary, a definition could be provided within this, um, within 7.0000. Yeah, um, let's let's see what Chris there. has to say. Chris? Oh, I was just going to say that, um, well, two things. One is we would have to advertise a change to Article 12 to add a definition for um, the permit granting authority. So that's something that we probably should do, but it's not part of this current proposal. And the other thing I wanted to say is um, that I wanted to suggest that Doug could ask Rob Mora if he has any comments because um, he's you know, been deeply involved in helping us to come forth with this um, zoning amendment, and um, he has a unique perspective, and um, he's worked in multiple towns, and um, so he may be helpful in um, helping to sort things out. 
Okay, Chris, Rob, or do you want to say anything about this? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, as as pointed out, the permit granting authority is not a defined term in our bylaw. So, you know, if I'm reading this provision, looking at it, and it's not a particular use that requires a permit from a board, uh, you know, I would act, you know, and and be able to make adjustments or modifications. Uh, being the person that would be granting the permit. Now, certainly we can define it differently. Uh, we can say permit granting authority or building commissioner if, you know, there isn't a land use permit, it just gets more lengthy, uh, you know, but we don't have that defined term in our bylaw. In most cases throughout the bylaw, it says special permit granting authority or permit granting board. It's, it's more rare for it to just say permit granting authority. So it's, it doesn't come with a defined meaning. Now that said, zone, the Zoning Act 40A does define permit granting authority and it's generally known as the, the Board of Appeals or the Zoning Administrator. So, um, you know, I would think if there was a conflict with the term, uh, legal review would, would bring that up for us and, and ask us to either change the term or add in and building commissioner again, if the situation is appropriate to do so. And so you're comfortable with the way this bylaw is written right now uh, with the term permit granting authority in it uh, as and being undefined. Is that correct? It, it is because I don't, although I, I don't disagree with correcting the definition and getting that straightened out, it's a that's a big job right now because our bylaw, as I said, uses permit granting board, special permit granting authority permit granting authority and so on. So there's, there's, you know, too many cases throughout the bylaw where adjustments will need to be made. And that just isn't right. within the scope of what we're looking at today. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold this proposal up for something like that uh, and leaving it an undefined term would give the flexibility that is needed for us to enforce this, this bylaw. Well, I guess, I guess I'm puzzled why uh, Maureen, you, you brought this subject up today you know, this uh, bylaw is unchanged from the last time we met. Um, we we didn't touch on that subject earlier. It sounds like you've kind of introduced a topic and it's created uncertainty about what we've got, um, maybe unnecessarily. So can, can, Maureen, what, why, why was this brought up? Uh, we just wanted to clarify, you know, the distinction between the various um, uh, decision authorities um, and, you know, it, so it was to clarify it, but, it, it, you know, as Rob had indicated, if our town attorney feels that there is a conflict with 40A, um, I, I would assume that the town attorney would make suggested revisions um, to this language. Um, you know, Rob had suggested maybe uh, the town attorney, if he felt that there was a need for change, could say, you know, permit granting board and building commissioner. Um, so I think there are um, certainly ways to deal with this if needed um, under uh, 40A. Okay, thank you. Chris? So do we want to consider adding the words um, or building commissioner after? Um, in other words, change the wording here, permit granting board or building commissioner. Well, if that's the way you intend to use those terms, I mean, it seems like that would remove this kind of omission that we've that you've brought up. And I wonder if um, Rob has an, uh, um, an understanding of that and whether that would work. Has the town attorney uh, reviewed this bylaw proposal? He's seen it and I don't think he's come forth with a written, um, written document about it, but um, he has seen it. Okay, Rob? So I would just suggest that we, we not just simply insert or building commissioner in that section, because what we don't wanna do is give the building commissioner authority to waive in cases where it should be the, the permit granting board. So uh, if there's a problem with the using the term permit granting authority, 
uh, you know, we need to we need to build out that a little further and say building commissioner, you know, something like when a land use permit is not required, whatever the proper language would be to do that. So it is, I don't think it's just a simple insert building commissioner in that, in that uh, section. But, but you are comfortable with the language as written right now. And I'm comfortable with the, yeah, I'm comfortable with the language. I would have, of course have to interpret it. And, and like I said, reading that, in a case where there isn't a special permit or a site plan review needed, I would insert myself as the permit granting authority and make the decision in that mm -hmm. case. But otherwise it would be directed to the permit granting board for the, the review and approval. Okay. Thank you. Janet. So I think, so I think we could add um, the building commissioner to the waiver sections um, and that will take care, that will cover single family homes and ADUs and give the building commissioner authority to apply the different criteria. I think that I've been saying this really from the get-go is that structurally, you know, like these ideas of a more built out management plan, like I love that idea of being much more clear about the different components of it because section 7.912 is, you know, it's kind of, it's a little short and, and, you know, there's a lot of things that people, that um, owners can do to provide alternative transportation. I would just pull all this flexible language and the criteria, and I would just put it into the waiver section. I bulk out the management section. It would be very clear that the waiver section applies to all the other parts. And you wouldn't have this duplicative. I mean, this this is there's all this duplicate. There's references to management plans in different parts and waivers and peak parking needs shows up again and again. It's really confusing, and I think if you just put it into the waiver section, gave a very early heads up that a waiver is possible under seven point nine. Um, I think a lot. You know, I, you know, we deal with waivers all the time, and so I don't think we're going to scare anybody off by having a really clear kind of bulked up list of factors. I would add factors like age and economic stuff, but I still think the boards just don't know what weight to give it without okay. that. Thank you. Um, Rob. Uh, thanks, yeah, I just wanna give you, I know Maureen addressed this uh, in detail. I wanna give you one reason, one example why I'd like to see these provisions put up front in the bylaw and not by waiver. Uh, and this is a real common occurrence for us uh, in code enforcement. Uh, let's say a single family home, two bedroom, rental property, uh, has four people living in it, possibly four cars associated with it, one or two parking spaces. That investor comes to us, which can do by right, come to us and ask us to finish the attic, finish the basement, add two additional bedrooms. Now we have a four bedroom home. Now we have more cars, on the site and we have a single parking space or possibly two parking spaces. Those cars end up out in the street. Those cars are not uh, provided for on site. Putting this language in the bylaw up front gives as criteria to be complied with under certain conditions gives us the ability to do something in an enforcement situation that we can't do now. Now that's just one reason, one example, Maureen mentioned several of them, but that's one, one very important reason why I'd like to see that moved out of a waiver provision where it's not enforceable as criteria for these uh, by right situations. But Rob, right. Thanks Rob. Can, I, can um, I follow up on that? Because the language that you're taking out of it, it says in section 7.0, except as may be required, blah, 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 parking spaces shall be provided in at least the following minimum amounts. So that gives, so it's clear that you can require more and that language you're taking out, which doesn't make sense to me because that gives, a, it gives everybody an early heads up that the permit right, might require a lot more than two spaces. And if you need power to do that for a permit, then let's just give it to you up front. If you do it over single family houses, you know, I, I, I just think that we should just stick with the structure that's here and bulk it up and, you know, fix it in, in the context of it, not keep on adding more and more in duplicative language. So, okay, sorry. thank you. So um, Rob, do you want to say anything else? 
just that under the current structure, the minimum requirement, the uh, parking space requirement is two and that is satisfied if there are two and uh, there's no request for waiver. Therefore, I don't have the ability right now to require any additional parking spaces if two are provided for the dwelling unit. Right, okay. All right, so um, thank you all. Um, is there any public comment on this bylaw? Uh, Mr. Brick, please state your name and your address. Pam, are you able to bring Ira over? Okay, Ira, you're unmuted. Okay. I'm Ira Brick, 255 Strong Street. I just wanna add some thoughts to this. Um, some uh, common sense that has been stated already that if a house is rented by four people, four students with cars, let's say, since that's the maximum legal, um, two spots is not adequate. And if they have four cars, which we do live in the age where people bring cars to school. We're not in the age where we've eliminated cars. Where do those other two cars go? There's an obvious problem there. And from what I have heard, the UMass lots are full. Streets all around the university are full during the day, uh, clogging those streets. And um, I think that we need to deal with the true cost of bringing a car to town. If somebody is in the student rental business and there's four students there and there's two spots, that person, that landlord should make a contribution to the municipal system, figuring out what it really costs to support um, more public parking spots. And as it is now, the controversial idea of a parking lot behind CVS, if that's just going to get eaten up with cars that uh, there's not adequate parking at houses, that's not going to leave any parking for the people who want to use downtown as a downtown with commercial businesses and so on. And, you know, they say that if you can measure it, you can manage it. And I think a lot of what we're talking about here is it not being measured. And so it's not going to be able to be managed. And I think that we need to keep the thumb screws realistically tight here. If somebody can't provide parking, I live in a, in a four bedroom house. I've mentioned several times that uh, before the people that we bought this house from a family, there was 21 college students in this house. And there were probably cars all over the place, just like my neighbor three doors down has six cars uh, on the driveway and on the front lawn and everywhere. So this is another situation where we would like to make it uh, amenable for somebody who's in the student rental business, but it creates a problem for everybody if there's an overage of cars, and there clearly are. So um, I would just like to add to what people are saying that sometimes two spots are not needed. There's very few rental houses in town where there's just two students in each with a car. It's much more likely that there are numerous students with numerous cars, and I don't think that you are um considering that in what you're talking about now so thanks so much thank you ira okay i don't see any other hands from the public and uh we've we've certainly talked about this uh this particular bylaw proposal for probably four or five hours at this point is how it feels over over three meetings maybe um, I guess I'm wondering, would anybody be willing to make a motion for this for this proposal so that we can uh, close in on having a vote one way or the other on it? Uh, I see Tom. Yeah, I'll, I'll move to uh, approve this to be forwarded to town, uh, to the town council. Okay. All right. 
Thank you, Tom. Uh, Maria? We need to close it first, as well as, uh, what do you call it? What Tom said? <laughs> if, if so, oh, yes. To, to close the hearing? Yeah. Yeah. I think the public hearing was closed on July 21st, and you're oh. deliberating. OK, I missed that one. All right, uh, then I second Tom's move, motion. OK, thank you, Maria. Um, I guess I'll just offer that uh, I think I said this probably back on July 21st that uh, I don't view this as a real substantive change to the parking regulations in town. I view it as more of a, uh, a better articulation of the process and an improvement of the way we present our process to outsiders who may want to be doing work in town. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate Janet's interest in having an elegant organization of the material. Um, and I think in earlier meetings, I shared some of those concerns, but I have been swayed by the uh, arguments of the staff that uh, what we're, what they've proposed is actually helpful to them. And it's helpful to people who are working with this bylaw as they try to develop properties in town. Uh, Janet. So I think, I think it's pretty clear that this is still a work in progress. Um, you know, we opened and closed a hearing in one night on a almost a very different version and we've seen version after version. Um, I think I agree with, with Andrew that we should put the shadow parking in. Um, that's not here. Um, the parking management plan should be fleshed out more. I think I think this is going to make it very confusing structurally and you know like there's constant you know management plans and waivers and um you know shared parking popping up over and over again it's not going to take forever to make it elegant it just takes just just sort of sitting through it we're not including really key factors and we're not without studies we're never going to be able to the boards will never be able to make consistent intelligent decisions. So I think that's a separate issue. We need some real data to base decisions on, not just ideas that we think of on a night. But I don't think this is ready to send to town council. I think it's I think it's kind of messy. And um, it doesn't have to be beautiful, but it has to be logical and clear to people. And I think some of these changes make things less and less clear, um, especially the alert at the beginning that you might be required to put in more than two spaces. I don't know why that language would be taken out because it's it's your heads up. There's also a whole section saying, you know, section 10 point some, you know, four or five and 11 do apply. Well, of course they apply, they're in a bylaw, but it's not gonna elucidate to anybody that the planning board of the ZBA can actually can put more um, parking and require more parking. It's like very, so it just, there's a lot of things in there. I just find very unclear that we could just eliminate and make it clear. Let's make it clear when the building commissioner can, to, can add stuff. I mean, let's just do it right and present a good package to the town council. I don't feel good about this. I don't think it's, it's gonna help. So I just don't think it's ready. And I think the discussion tonight shows that it's not ready. And I'm, I'm sorry that we're all going through this as a group of 10 all the time, but that's the you know, path that we've chosen. I just don't think it's ready. Thanks, thanks, Janet. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, just, um, I just wanted to follow up on some of Jenna's comments. Will, will some of the requests we've made be added to the language before it gets forwarded? I, I think the motion is that we would approve the language as is, but uh, will there be some more tweaks? Um, uh, we can, you know, certainly, I'll certainly talk to planning staff um, to see uh, if um, personally, I would love to make a parking management plan form. Um, they'll spell out exactly what they need to submit, including the map. Um, and we could explore um, looking at other the um, the suggested um, comments in the PowerPoint, um, which is the what is it the the shadow parking and also the 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 transport the transportation demands. Um, uh, program, uh, which gets into how, how does the uh, developer encourage, um, you know, reduction of, of, 
um, cars and uh, reduction of tri trip generation uh, on the property, such as carpooling or providing a um, shuttle bus. Um, so we could look at um, uh, adding that to the list of uh, criteria for the permit granting authority's discretion. Now, is I think I'm sorry, Andrew. Um, go ahead. Okay, I was going to just say, Doug, I, I thought like you did a, a fantastic job of summarizing the journey I've taken as well. And I think that, I think this does clarify. I think though a couple of those minor tweaks, I think also the one Janet mentioned about the heads up about additional parking, you know, maybe, maybe this is like a really quick couple of changes um, to just tighten up some of those potential um, areas where there might still be an ambiguity, but it is, I think to Doug's point, uh, to Doug's summation, it really is uh, a, a much cleaner uh, representation of what it means to do business here. So I don't know where that leaves us relative to the motion. Again, well, we, we have the motion. We, or we, tweet. we have the motion, you know, as it as originally made uh, on on the bylaw as proposed at the beginning of the meeting this evening. Um, we could certainly alter the motion uh, if somebody wants to make a motion, a second motion to do that. Chris? I think if you are going to vote on this tonight, you need to be really specific about what you are proposing to add. You would be specific and say that you um, approve or recommend this bylaw with the following um, specific additions. Otherwise, I think um, we're going to have to do some work on the bylaw and come back to you. Mm -hmm. And the next time we could come back to you would be um, November 17th. Um, the CRC is holding a public hearing on this on November 9th. But I feel uncomfortable, um, you know, having you. E so either you vote the current um, bylaw as proposed up or down, or you make specific suggestions about what it is you want to include and then vote on that, or we talk about this again on the 17th. Okay. Well, um, I'm just pulling up the slide about the transportation demand management program, which gets into how the developer would reduce the parking demand in, you know, with carpooling and bike facilities, shuttle services, um, and um, um, the other item is shadow parking. And um, we did touch upon about, um, you know, having a more specific parking management form. Um, Maureen, that, Maureen uh, am I correct that, that these two subjects could be something that we could, con that the, the permit granting of, you know, the, the planning board could introduce to the conversation when a particular project came to us? Um, Absolutely. So you just, actually just because they're just because they're not on the list right now, there's nothing to keep us from talking about that. Uh, correct. Um, in fact, um, keep this in your back pocket. So you you could um, um, as you review uh, special permits and site plan reviews uh, currently, you could certainly um, make these conditions of of a, a special right. permit or or a site plan review now. Okay. All right. So, you know, those adding those to this bylaw is not an essential act this evening. Correct. Um, so uh, it looks like Janet was next. Oh, so, if the, if the, so if the whole purpose of these additions and revisions is to make it really clear to applicants up front what they need to show us and what they what a management plan could look like or a trend, the demand management program looks like, it should go into the bylaw. I think that one of my criticisms of section 7.9, the waiver section is, it says this, some of this stuff, but it doesn't really make it clear that the goal is to make sure your tenants have enough parking or a way to get somewhere. And so I think you could put shadow parking, you can put the demand management, you could put the management plan and specify it more. And so when someone reads this, they're like, oh, I know what I have to do not hoping that when they come in front of the planning board, we're like, oh, by the way, here's the list. So I think I think these things should go in and I've seen them in other bylaws. Like I, the Somerville bylaw has a lot of very specific demand management strategies. It's not ex exclusive, but it gives somebody a heads up of what we're really talking about. So I would just wait two weeks 
you know, put this together, make it more clear, um, not hand somebody a piece of paper when they're coming to a hearing, but to basically have it in the bylaw, like this is what we're thinking. We wanna make sure that residents and tenants can get around. Um, I would, of course, take out the on-street parking because um, I think it's a can of worms. But I do think we should take two weeks just to put this in. I don't know what the hurry is, or, but I do think if we're trying to be clear, clear and create clarity, let's do it in the bylaw. Thank you, Janet. Andrew? Yeah, I, I agree with Janet. I think if it is to be clear, it should be in there. I'm wondering, can the, can the, um, can the motion be phrased in such a manner where we we can provide enough direction. I don't know where those would go within the actual language, but the, the items that we just mentioned, I think do belong in there. And also if, you know, the vocabulary again, you're using Maureen in your presentation is industry standard. I think that, you know, should be integrated as much as possible as well to, to demonstrate that we're a town that's trying to stick with, uh, you know, some norms in place. Um, so it, would it be enough to amend the, the, um, the motion. The motion, just to say, and I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have all, all my regular notes with me, but to say, like, that that it will be amended to insert language around um, shadow parking, around, um, gosh, I apologize, I don't have it in front of me, but those, like, two or three items, could we just put that in there, and then that's enough for you to, to say, we'll make the right language, we'll drop it in where it needs to go, we, or do we have to get, like, super explicit? Chris, could you answer that? I think you have to get more specific. Um, so if you really want to include those things, I think you need to yeah. um, let us work on it. Tell us specifically what you want. You want shadow parking, you want transportation demand management, and what's the third thing? Parking management plan. Parking management plan. So yeah. which, we which add, is mentioned in the language, in the draft language, but we can um, um, tinker, tinker with that a bit. So yeah. if we add those three things um, and bring it back to you on the 17th, do you think you'll be able to vote at that time? Well, I mean, we could vote. I think we, there's probably, from what I've heard, a majority vote to that this is ready to go. So I think the question is, uh, do those people want to entertain a motion to edit this and bring it back in two weeks or not? Andrew? I guess I'm feeling like if we can provide, if we can list those three things off and put that in motion, that I don't think that I need to see it again. I, I would I would trust that the language could be incorporated. Um, so from my perspective, it does still seem like something that we could wrap up tonight. Okay. Well, it seems like Chris is saying, you know, we either need to really be very specific about exactly where we want it or they need to go back and think about it and bring it back. So I don't think we have the option, at least the, the staff doesn't really want us to approve it with just a, a less than specific uh, set of directions. Is that accurate, Chris? Uh, that's accurate. I, I mean, again, we could ask Rob what he thinks, but I'm uncomfortable um, having you vote on something that is you know, just a phrase because we need to figure out where are these right. phrases going to go in the bylaw. And, um, you know, we have so many discussions about specific language that if we um, venture to create language, but you haven't seen it yet, and yet we're saying that you recommended it, that doesn't sound like a good, um, good plan to me. But again, maybe Rob has some words of wisdom to add. Rob? Yeah, so it's maybe just slightly different opinion than Chris on this one. Um, I think we have the, the transportation demand management program, the, the shadow parking language um, pretty well understood. So I, I feel comfortable that Maureen can insert that into the proposed language and, um, you know, we can, we can have, you know, meet the intent of what you're asking for if, if you were to make a motion to recommend with the additional, those additional items, we're gonna make sure it's put in the right place and it, and, and it functions properly. Okay, thank you. I guess one concern that I've got is this, this bulleted list of considerations is never gonna be complete. There is no way for us to identify every single possible 
consideration and put that in this bylaw. So I think what we have in this bylaw as written is a perfectly good, you know, adequate set of reasonable considerations. And if there are, you know, there's going to be more. It doesn't matter what we, how many we put in. Uh, we're never going to cover them all. So, you know, why why do we want to start down this road? And and you know, because in two weeks somebody will think of another thing that we should add, and we'll be back in another two weeks. Um, so I'm. I am uh, not in favor of going down this road. Uh, Maria, you look like you're next. That was exactly what I was gonna say. What Maureen showed were examples, not the answers. There were samples uh, and I, I totally agree. I thought, oh, I could come up with 20 more options for different ways to show ways that I need or don't need parking. So I agree, like uh, usually during this process, people come to the planning department talk with Chris, talk with Maureen, talk with Rob Mora, and they will give them feedback like, oh, here are some other ways you could figure out um, alternate parking solutions. They will share this information. It's not like something that the board springs on them at the last minute. I mean, there's a lot of conversation that happens in the process well before it's brought in front of the ZBA or the planning board. Um, so I, I think that those, all those conversations, all that stuff, the staff has that they can share it with the potential developers and property owners that come to them. I think exactly right. We could make this 10 pages long if we wanted to. I, I, I love the ideas, but I don't think we're supposed to spell them all out in detail here. It, it seems like a mistake. So um, that's my two cents. Okay. Uh, Janet. I appreciate, uh, I'm appreciating the work that Maureen did on the, you know the current thinking and the the ex the factors of you know age. Um, we know that undergraduates seem to have a remarkable number of cars. Um, you know perhaps student status would be another one, um, and also economic um, situation. And, and so those are pretty generally understood factors, so they could be added in. Um, I have a so I I do think we should look at this in two weeks. I would never agree to approve language I haven't actually read. But um, Chris, I have a question, like what would you bring to the CRC on Tuesday if this was voted now with additions, but they're not specified? Would that be hard for you to do or would that just be, it is a confusing process. Thank you, Janet. Um, Chris. I think we would do our best to put language together that reflects what, you're, what you wanted us to add. Um, and I understand that you wanted us to add reference to uh, tra transportation demand management and shadow parking. Was there anything else that you wanted us to add? So that seems to be the, the bulk of it. So if it's those two things and Rob thinks we can fit them in um, in a logical place um, in, with logical wording, then I'm comfortable with your making this um, motion, amending your motion to include those two things and bringing that to um, the CRC. Okay, Tom. I'll amend my motion to include those two items um, where uh, the planning department sees fit within this bulleted list. Okay, thank you, Tom. Andrew? I'll second that. All right. Um, all right, so why don't we go ahead and let's see. And I see two public comment people. Uh, Pam, can we set the clock for two minutes for each of them? And can we recognize Ronnie Parker first? Okay, we can as long as um, other people don't share their screen. Otherwise, you won't be able to see mine. Okay, two minutes. Ronnie, Ronnie, you are recognized to speak. Please give your name and your address. Hi, Ronnie. Okay, now I have the authority to unmute. Um, I'm Ronnie Parker. I just came today to see how the planning board works on topics that I haven't been part of in the past. Um, I do believe that you have a responsibility representing us to take the two weeks to get things clear. 
Yes, there are a million possibilities in any set of rules. But if you know of three or four that are important and that will clarify things, please take the time to do so for the rest of us. I'm not a developer, I'm not a renter, but I think in general, it's really helpful to have good logical structure in the rules that were intended to follow. So um, you have, I don't know if you've voted yet even, but any, in any event, do take the time. Two weeks doesn't really matter overall. Why the rush? Let's all be clear. And you as members of the planning board have an obligation to us to read and be clear about what you're putting forward to the town council. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Next is Dorothy Pam. Hi, Dorothy. Hi. Uh, I have a couple of comments. I looked for the documents so that I could read something ahead of time and there were no documents provided uh, on the agenda or for the public. Um, in listening to this um, off and on tonight, I, I will just say I felt a severe air of unreality. Uh, it is Byzantine and it is, I don't think it's connected to the real world. Um, we live in New England, winter is coming. People have cars, people need cars. I think a builder has responsibility to provide parking. And um, if a renter is told, oh, we have a special parking management plan and we expect you to go find used buses or share parking, even though you don't go to the same place at the same time, um, a renter will say, okay, okay, and they'll pretend. And then they'll just go figure out how to find some on-street parking. Um, I just don't think this is real or how things go. I mean, my school does a survey every semester about do you do car sharing? Do you do this and that? Uh, I know a number of people who teach at HCC. I've never met anybody who has to go there at the same time and come home the same time I do. So you can have a paid office of car sharing. It doesn't mean it's a real thing that happens to real people. And we are in New England. So I just think you should have requirement for parking. I like your discussion of shadow parking. I saw you working on that with a previous property. I think that's a really good idea. Um, but um, I, I think the idea that you're gonna find a way to not provide parking uh, for somebody here and there uh, because they're gonna ride their bike or something is, is ridiculous. More people are using their cars more than ever. Students are coming to school with cars because COVID has brought out that kind of a 9-11 mentality. When people say, I gotta have a getaway car, I need to have my car and they have them. So um, I, I don't really like the new direction this is going because I don't think it's real. And people will say, is this how you do business in Amherst? I can't even figure it out because it's not clear what it says and, and who it's speaking to. So anyway, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Uh, next is Pam Rooney, name and address. Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, thanks very much to Maureen for the very in-depth uh, background information. I, um, I think that would have been absolutely a marvelous starting point for this conversation back before July 21st with just a really good basis on which to start building the conversation. Um, so thank you for that. It's it's way it's way late in the in the process, but um, I'm I'm glad at least it got brought to the table. I would strongly advocate that you change your motion and um, and send this. Um, give yourself another couple of weeks to get the wording correct. Um, I think it is important that we start with the premise that, that we require at least two cars per unit and that there will then be some modification of that up or down and make that very clear um, based on the factors listed um, so that we're, we're, we all really, really, really want to reduce the number of cars in town. But, but it's okay if we require more parking to begin with to keep them off the streets, to keep them uh, out of the neighboring uh, neighborhoods and keep them on a property. Um, I think that's, that's a starting point. As cars reduce, they can turn those more and more frequently then into shadow parking and turn it back into grass. But I think we have an obligation to neighborhoods to require at least two car cars per dwelling unit um, and then let them prove you 
strong. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Jennifer Taub, please state your name and your address. Uh, Jennifer Taub, 259 Lincoln Avenue. And I'm also um, echoing Dorothy. I think the in it, it seems like with what where this is going and the wording and the thrust is that you're providing incentives for developers to find alternatives to providing parking. I think the bottom line assumption should be that the developer or property owner does provide parking. And there may be instances where it's reasonable to, to find or to accept the developers, you know, providing documentation that there are alternatives. But the bottom line is students who are mostly the rent, men, often the renters in town, bring cars, every student bring, brings their own car in most all cases. I sent a number of photographs at the beginning, a couple of months ago to the planning board, just walking within a few blocks of where I live um, in the neighborhood adjacent to UMass. And for every house, and these are houses that are within one, two, three, four blocks of campus, there, there are usually four students in a house because that's the maximum you're allowed. And there are four cars in the driveway to every house. So the property owners should absolutely have to provide parking. And sometimes there may be alternatives, but that's really the exception if we're dealing in reality. And you know, we, students may be driving more electric cars, um, hybrids, but they'll still need to park. And um, I think there's sometimes the assumption that if you're near a transit line or if you're close to campus, then they don't need parking spots because they don't need a car. But McClure Avenue, which is literally almost on the UMass campus, the entire street is student rentals and it looks like a parking lot. So I think there has to be an assumption that there will be cars and there are, it's the exception when there can be alternatives to onsite parking. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, that looks like the last of the public comment. So Maureen. Yes, I just wanted to clarify the proposal maintains a minimum of two parking spaces per dwelling unit. Um, so um, yeah, so so I, in fact, the proposal is pretty consistent with what a couple of the of the public commenters said we ought to be doing. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, we have a motion, and um, you know we can vote it up. We can vote it down. Um, so, uh, Tom, do you have your hand up? Just a quick point of clarification: Do we need to vote on my amendment to that before well, we vote on the actual thing? I'm just trying yeah, to figure out. It's my understanding we had an original motion, and then you requested to amend it, and both of those acts of yours were seconded by Andrew. So I, uh, Chris, Chris, continue to nod your head if you agree with me that uh, we really only have one motion on the table at the moment, so we only need to have one vote. All right. Great, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Andrew, or uh, uh, rather Janet, uh, how about two minutes for your final comment before we vote? I, actually, I don't have a comment. Um, can you read the motion? Does, does the motion include a management plan, transportation, demand management, and shadow parking? Could you just read that motion? I believe it only include, includes the last two of those. And, and parking management plan is already part of the bylaw. Okay, so it's not going to make that more more specific. Okay, transportation. Okay. And it sounded like Rob was comfortable with us simply asking for those two terms to be added. And I think Chris sounded like she's willing to go along with that if Rob will give her a hand. So with that, um, why don't we go ahead and vote uh, either to recommend this with the two uh, requested additions to town council. Uh, Maria. Approved. Uh, Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. 
Janet. Oh, no, not yet. And I'm an I. Okay, so. All right. Um, so uh, that is the item number 3A, I believe, on our agenda. The time is 8.35. Why don't we take a five minute break? Uh, so we'll come back at 8.40. Please uh, turn off your video and mute yourself. Doug, I've been uh, out of town all day. May I ask how uh, the election went for Sarah yesterday? 
um, Sarah was was defeated. Oh, so um, yeah, but I I would I think we ought to try to keep the politics out of this meeting. Yep, fair enough. Thank you. It's cold here in Yellowstone. I put on my vest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the time is 8.41. And let's see, have we got a quorum back? I think Andrew was back. Tom is back. Janet's back. We don't yet, we have Nate, Nate has joined us. We don't yet have Rob and Maureen. Chris, do we need Rob and Maureen in order to proceed? Um, you need Rob and oh, here they are. nice they to are. have Maureen and there she is. <laughs> yeah, so we have everybody back. So the time is 841 and we'll move on to the next item, uh, another item of old business. This is uh, regarding zoning bylaw. Article three, use regulations, section 3.325, mixed use buildings and article 12 definitions. Um, discussion of the bylaw that we have previously approved for recommendation to town council, but I believe it has come back to us in slightly modified form from uh, CRC. And we talked about this, these modifications in a, in a last meeting. So Chris, do you want to say anything again to, about this tonight? Um, I would uh, like to point out that there were certain things that we wanted to have the planning board um, focus on. And if Nate could bring up an email that I sent him um, earlier this evening, that would help. Um, yeah, so I have that I have that email up. Should I just read those items or? Yes, that would be very good, yep. Okay, so. Uh, so Chris, this is in an email you sent to all of us uh, last Wednesday, October 27th. This is when went to the planning board and you asked or suggested that we might focus on the, the following aspects of this revised mixed use building amendment. One, definition of common space. Two, reduction from 40% to 30% for non-residential space and parentheses, common space will no longer be included in the calculation for non-residential space, and thus the percentage of non-residential space may be smaller than 40%, and parentheses. Three, distribution of non-residential space among floors in a single building. Four, distribution of non-residential space among mixed-use buildings on a, second, on a single property. Five, use of the word predominantly. And uh, Chris added the note, Nate and Chris spoke with the town attorney, Joel Bard, on September 10th, 2021, and he suggested the use of the word predominantly. So that is the, sub, that's what Chris sent us. Um, so we can pick up our conversation where we were last time, uh, unless uh, Chris, anybody, you know, from the staff wants to do any sort of presentation again tonight. I think Nate might want to present um, a few things. So if you would okay. let him do that. All sure. right. Sure. Yes. Um, thanks everyone. I'm Nate Maloya, planner with the town. The uh, mixed use bylaw hasn't changed since the last time we spoke. I think, you know, the CRC met um, since then and they discussed it. They didn't make a recommendation yet. They were 
also considering the 30 percent um, and the points that Chris referenced. Um, you know, there, the bylaw that was sent in the packet, I'll just share my screen, uh, is that that's, that's visible, I take it. Yes. Great. The, um, you know, what this is really showing is the changes in yellow are what we highlighted last time uh, from the previous version in August. So, um, you know, the first paragraph is the 70%, um, including common areas shared by multiple uses, and then the 30%. Um, and it wasn't, you know, clearly explained that the, the, the highlighted section in blue was what the, the community resource committee recommended um, back at the end of August, that the permit granting authority may allow, you know, non-residential uses to be distributed on any floor in any building or in, you know, different buildings on a um, multiple building development on the same property, um, as long as the first floor is predominantly non-residential uses. And the town attorney added the sections in gray, you know, the portion of the first or ground floor um, be occupied predominantly by these non-residential uses. So the town attorney had looked at this and thought with those additions, it clarified um, that, you know, 30% is required. It can be distributed amongst, you know, in, you know, on different floors in a building, so long as the first floor is mostly, you know, the, the street facing portion is predominantly non-residential. And so it still satisfies the intent of the bylaw that we are activating the street, um, but allows flexibility to have this required 30% be distributed on, on different floors. Um, as Chris mentioned, this, this third paragraph in yellow, you know, we were running into a, a problem where the shared spaces, you know, hallways, elevators, lobbies, um, it was difficult to calculate how that is considered non-residential or residential. Um, and so here we're saying that, um, you know, incidental spaces, which is allowed as part of non-residential shall not include common areas shared by multiple uses or other spaces not contiguous with the non-residential use unless the space is included in the description of the premises leased to the non-residential tenant. And what this means is that, you know, um, a storage area that's down, the, down a hallway um, unless it's part of a lease agreement to the non-residential tenant, it cannot be included in the 30% calculation. And so, you know, staff feels that this is a clarification uh, and it helps us determine how to, you know, code the, the, the floor areas, you know, whether it's non-residential, common space, residential or parking. And so really only the, you know, non-residential counts towards the 30% and 70% is residential parking or common areas. And there are examples in the packet, they're the same ones that were shared last time that showed, um, I'll just go to one of them quickly. You know, here's one from, um, you know, this is from Boston, International Building, and this is how, you know, the Boston, um, you know, how they actually looked at this too. There's retail or non-residential and pink common, space in blue and then residential in yellow. And so, you know, this, it, it actually works with our bylaw so that only the 30% can be this in, within this pink area. In this example, it's 40 to 45 to 50%. This is just, you know, not showing what our bylaw, you know, our bylaw is a 30% is a minimum. Someone could choose to do more than that. Um, so this, you know, is just an illustrative example, but this is how they actually coded it for their mixed use interpretation as well. And it makes it easy to determine what is the non-residential space, as opposed to saying, you know, is 70% of this blue included in the non-residential or is it part of the residential? And so the bylaw now clarifies that. So I don't, you know, I don't have any more unless we want to have um, okay. discussion. Okay. Uh, is there any board discussion about this? I think there must have been something left to be said since we continued this from or an earlier meeting. Hmm. Not seeing any. Do we have any public comment on this? Ah, one, one commenter from the board, Janet. Um, so I think we need as much business and retail and commercial activity as we can in our village centers in downtown. And um, I think Adam Smith said, economic activity begets economic activity which has helped me understand the world economy. So the more stuff there is to do and buy and shop or you know, services to visit, 
the more people will. And so um, I think that, you know, we were at 40%, we were at the lowest amount of first floor retail professional or, or commercial space of the towns and cities studied. And for, for no reason at all that I can, I've heard that we were at 40%, not at 50 or 60%. And now it's shrunk even more and spread out into the building. So I think we just lost, we just lost a lot with this weakening. It's just, we're sort of shrinking and weakening um, our downtown and village center economies. I do like the um, exclusion of common space. I still think the incidental space is a little confusing and I'm not sure um, it's, it, it, it needs to be there. Um, also predominantly is a vague term and then different boards will interpret it differently. So that leads to inconsistent results um, and is not really providing a lot of clarity to applicants. Um, and then I also think that if CRC didn't want um, to see apartments downtown, if we're at 30% non-residential and spreading it out through the building other than a veneer on the front, we're kind of almost there. And so I, I just think we should strengthen the, the concept of mixed use. I would, you know, no one wants to go to 60%. We, you know, that was five years ago. Um, I would suggest 50% just to, to keep it strong um, and allow the incidental space, you know, we'll just assume that's part of the non-residential use. And so I, that, that's my pitch. Okay, thank you, Janet. Andrew. And I was just going to say, I think what made me comfortable with this, the 30% on, on surface does sound like it's too low, but knowing that it's, it's designed to be at the front of the building, and I think this is more a question of frontage than area, um, makes me feel comfortable. Also, I think by pulling out the common area, I think you eliminate the, the, the possibility of, of you know, someone claiming uh, a lot of common area as, as helping meet their obligation. Um, and then also we had discussed um, the importance of, of having um, accessible housing on ground floor. And I think that this is, this, um, that, that had resonated with me as part of this proposal as well is that um, it does have, it, it provides greater ability to provide accessible housing on the ground floor in a situation where you may not be able to provide a, a, an elevator. So. All right. Nothing thank new there, but just uh, thanks for the time. Thank you, Maria. Um, I agree with Andrew. Yeah, the the frontage is the critical value to maintain. Um, the percentage, I would worry going higher would actually prevent entire projects from happening. So we don't want that. Uh, we want to provide something that's realistic. There's, you'll hear different things from different groups. Um, I, I think one of our minutes, or I remember writing the minutes saying Gabriel Gould thought that 30 was reasonable, 40 wasn't. And, um, you know, the world of retail is changing. Doesn't mean that this is set in stone and we can't come back to it. I think every planning staff that's presented an amendment has said, you know, we can come back and revise these as needed. So, um, knowing that they have that kind of open mind to you know all this work we're doing, I feel comfortable testing it as is with the 30, um, maintaining that, yeah, predominantly the first floor street side is non-residential. I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. I want more projects to be built and not prevented from being built. So um, I'd like to see something move forward and this looks great to me. All right, thank you. Um, Janet. I, this, I, I was a little bit confused by this, this really dark um, blue band, that language is still in there. And I wonder if we can just put it on the screen for, um, for the people in the audience, like the, the revision. Nate? Uh, this, is, that, is that visible now, except yes. at the permit granting authority? Is yeah. That, yeah. Yep, is that's, it, that's in there, Janet. So that, that whole section in whatever color, that's not struck out. Okay. Yep. And nothing's been removed since last time. So this is all, you know, that was recommended by the CRC and they're still, you know, they haven't removed it yet. And we, right. we think it allows that flexibility while maintaining the, the you know, the street facing uh, first or ground floor as a non-residential use. Did they recommend this or are they still talking about it? No, they recommended it. 
Okay. And then those changes in yellow we've made. So, that, you know, they're picking it up again, similar to the planning board, you know, looking at, um, you know, we redefine the common space and this percentage change. And so, you know, their focus is on, you know, the 30% and the, the things in yellow. Um, they may also discuss this distribution among floors, but really that's something they've already recommended. Oh, because I, I, I went to the meeting and I thought Steve Schreiber and Dorothy Pam were had a lot of questions, but I didn't realize they had officially voted on it. They did okay. previously, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, any other board member comments? For, okay, we have one, one public commenter. Uh, Pam, could you bring Dorothy Pam over? Dorothy. Hi, <clears throat> Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. Uh, I guess I was uh, surprised to see the picture with 40% still. Um, for me, um, that's confusing and misleading. I thought we were going to see, if you're talking 30%, we'd see a picture of what 30% looked like. Um, I would say if you adopt this version of mixed use, that people should please retire the word vibrant. I'm sick of it anyway but they use it when they talk about the streetscape and the different activities that would make people wanna go there and walk into a store or go in and have an experience because it's really um, you know, an apartment building with maybe a little something on the first floor, maybe something on another floor, who knows? But um, it's, uh, you can kill retail by saying retail is dead. Um, and I think, I think the big issue really is the rents. If the rents are too high, we're not going to get the kind of stores and experiences that we want. Um, and I, this has been brought up a number of times, but it's never been seriously considered that if there's something that the town is doing to make it helpful or possible for a builder to build a, a mixed use building, that um, there might be some way in which to encourage that builder to have um, spaces that could be afforded by people, new buildings, interesting things. Because we right now it's pretty, pretty dull. There are very few things to go to that one wants to check into downtown. And I think the secret really is the, 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 how high the rent is and that we should have more small places that people can afford. That's it. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Welcome. Uh, next public comment is from Pam Rooney. Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, we say that we want mixed use buildings in the, in the BG and not apartment buildings. You all had a, quite a conversation about that. Um, and I am saying if that's really how you feel, then please make this no more than 60% residential on the ground floor rather than 70. Uh, I, we're just, we're just not creating any opportunities for any kind of flexibility. We all talk about flexibility. And here's a prime example where if you really, I can't imagine Amherst books with only 30% of that floor area being books or, or even Hastings, which is a relatively small store being Hastings. And we don't know, we don't know if it's, um, going to be retail per se or some sort of community space that is developed but by golly you really can't make it with with such a small percentage of non-residential so please do the right thing and make it no more than 60 percent residential in your recommendation to the town council that's where you were a month ago keep it that way and and um i'll leave it at that Thank you, Pam. Uh, the next public comment is uh, just went away. So, okay. Um, Kitty Axelson Barry, please state your name and your address. Hi, um, Kitty Axelson Barry, 89 Stony Hill Road. Um, you know, we were, one of you was talking a little bit earlier about how. Um, we should be green and we should, I don't know if social justice was mentioned, but all about like how we should conserve energy and pay attention to climate change and be a forward thinking community. But I think that 
destroying retail or certainly not supporting it at all um, is is the opposite of that. I think that, you know, if people can only buy from large big box stores over in Hadley, or they can only buy through the internet and support Jeff Bezos, that's not very socially conscious. And I don't think it encourages the, um, um, the, the environment very much. So I would like us to support small local businesses. And I agree about providing rent that's reasonable. The other thing is that, um, I, I don't understand how like putting a therapy off, you know, social workers office on like the fourth, the third floor of a nearby building in the same building complex contributes at all to the purpose of activating the streetscape. I, I just don't understand how, how we could possibly allow that as counting now. You were talking before, it's like, well, this doesn't prevent somebody from like doing more than 40% or more than this or that. Well, people, um, developers are not prevented from renting to, um, you know, a dermatology business or, or a social, you know, I was using this, a therapy business. Um, they're not prevented from renting to them, but we're talking about like activating the streetscape. And so I think we should stick to that. I really do. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris. Hi, um, yeah, I just wanted to remind people that zoning doesn't um, regulate the rents that are charged by the developers. Um, and so, so zoning really can't do anything about rents on the ground floor. That's up to the developer to decide that. And if the town wanted to set aside a fund to um, you know, help developers to charge less for their ground floor space, maybe that would be a direction that we could go in, but that wouldn't be zoning. So tonight we're talking about zoning. I just wanted to remind people about that. Thanks. All right, thank you, Chris. Janet. So uh, I doubt I'll sway anybody. Maybe I'm just saying it for my the minutes, but um, I've spoken to several um, downtown businesses and I've asked them, you know, is Amherst unfriendly to businesses? And they've said no. And, I, and they've said the problem is the rents are really high and they go up. And, you know, they're still doing good business, but the rent is going up and their business isn't really increasing. And so I think we should do everything we can to get foot traffic, more people coming to the village centers in downtown and if the theory is that if you build more rental units, rents will come down. If you build more commercial and retail and professional spaces, those, those rents should come down too. Instead, we've lost 15, you know, businesses downtown when business, you know, when the archipelago built one East Pleasant Street, um, they did add um, something to Kendrick Place. But I think is we're gonna have a shrinking amount of first floor space rents will stay high and we're not helping small businesses, which actually are the, you know, kind of backbone of our economy. And so I think, you know, it's not just the developers we're worried about who are, seem very interested in downtown and we have a lot of activity, probably the envy of a lot of area towns in this area, but we should think about the small businesses, like where can they go? You know, what happened to those people? Some of the businesses moved to the village centers, a lot of them shut, you know, if there was more space for them, the rents would be lower, there'd be more activity, they'd make more money, more people would come downtown, more people would want to live downtown. So I, I don't think we should pit, you know, the, or look at the needs of the developers all the time, but think about the small business owners. Okay, so you are advocating for a higher percentage of non-residential use. Yeah, I think 30% is just, it's, you know, 40% was the lowest and now we're at 30%. I just don't get it. Okay, thank you. So, um, not seeing any more comments, uh, no more hands. Uh, why don't we go ahead and get a motion for this proposal as written, and then we can talk about whether there are any amendments we would want to make to it. Does anybody want to move this proposal to recommend it to town council? Andrew. So moved. Thanks, Andrew. Anybody want to second it? Well, I will. I okay, Tom. You can you can second it. I'll second. All right. Uh, any discussion about this or, or any requests to amend it? Okay. 
Um, not seeing any. I guess we'll go right in into a vote. Um, so this is a motion to recommend this revised proposal as written as received from CRC to town council. Uh, we'll do a roll call. Maria. Approved. Uh, Tom. Approved. Andrew. Hi. And Janet. No. And I am a, an I. Approve. Okay. So I believe we've previously closed the hearing on this as well. So we're finished with that article for this evening. Uh, next item on the agenda, old business topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting. Chris, do we have any? Uh, you are no, mute. I don't have any. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any new business? No, not, not yet. <laughs> no, okay, no. well, you're running out of time to come, come up with some. <laughs> uh, Form A, A&R subdivision. No, not tonight. No, no from both. Okay. ZBA applications, anything you want us to know about? Not anything new. Okay. SPP, SPR, SUB applications. Yes, we have, um, I don't know if I told you about this last time, but Emmers College submitted an application for three signs that escaped their previous application. So you're going to be hearing that. And then there's also a mixed use building on Main Street that is going to be coming to you for um, changes to their site, mostly having to do with um, associated parking. So you'll be seeing those two on the 17th. Um, you'll also be seeing a new zoning amendment, which we may have told you about um, Article 14, which is going to be um, the request is to extend the time frame for Article 14, and that's the um, temporary zoning to allow outdoor dining and other things to occur during the COVID-19 um, situation. And the extension would be to, um, I think it would be to December of 2023. So those are the things that I know about right now. Okay. All right. Um... Item eight on the agenda is planning board committee and liaison reports. Uh, Jack is not here, so I guess we won't have a report on the PVPC. Uh, Community Preservation Act, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, we met last week and got our first five presentations covering uh, from the community housing projects. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow, which I believe is going over historical preservation. And then we have another meeting next week week, which will cover off on, on recreation. So this is um, each applicant's opportunity to, uh, to present their case to the committee uh, and field questions from us directly. Great. And how long will the presentations continue? Will you be done in December or? Oh, the presentations will be wrapped up next week. So each, each uh, participant gets about 15 minutes. Um, so. Okay, great. I have no report on the Agricultural Commission. Um, Chris, I think it might be worth asking uh, Dave Zomek if uh, we should keep this on the agenda and or whether we should just consider that commission to be defunct for a while. Mm -hmm. I will ask him that. Uh, Tom, Design Review Board. Uh, sure, we had a meeting yesterday where we reviewed um, the new band shell um, that is coming to the common. Um, and it was very well received. Um, there were very minimal comments about, you know, it's in its early phase and it'll probably come to several boards over the next few weeks. So um, I think they just wanted to slide it past us um as design review first and see if we had any comments to pass on um but mainly it was it was well received and there are just a few comments around maintenance and um some some details here and there about who's providing what but um 
uh, yeah, it was a, a beautiful project, and I'm sure we'll see it here in a, a few weeks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, anything on CRC? Janet had a comment. Oh, okay, thank you. Janet, why don't you unmute? I think I might have spaced this, but does it come to us or the ZBA? Will that come to us? May I answer that? Yes, Chris. Um, so it won't code go to either board. Um, it is in the town right of way, um, being on the common. And so um, it's out of the jurisdiction of either the ZBA or the planning board. And I believe that Nate has talked to um, KP Law about that and has um, received word that it doesn't need to go to either board. So it's going to go to the Design Review Board, the Disability Access Advisory Committee, the Historical Commission, and I think that's it. Okay. And the Town Council, of course, because the Town Council has jurisdiction over the um, okay. over the right of way. Okay. All right. Uh, nothing else on CRC, right? Well, we're meeting with CRC on next Tuesday, and they're continuing their public hearing on, um, well, they're holding a public hearing on parking and access regulations. They're continuing the public hearing on mixed use buildings, and I think also the rezoning of the parcel behind CVS. So they're going to be busy next week, but I don't think I have anything to report about previous uh, CRC meetings other than what you've heard from Nate. Okay. All right. Uh, I have I have no report as the chair. Um, any report of staff, Chris? I have no report, but I'm glad that the um, elections were over and they seem to be um, done well, and I hope people are satisfied with the results. So I'm looking forward to working with the new uh, people. Great. Okay. Uh, the time is 9.12. Uh, if there's nothing else, we can adjourn. Thanks, Doug. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, uh, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, staff. All right. Chris, could you stay on for a minute after the recording? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to